The Computer Chronicles is brought to you by rondiamond.com, the oldies site on the internet. Music and memories from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not just another jukebox. Additional support comes from the law offices of Ivan Hoffman, lawyering with integrity for internet law, copyright, trademark, and other intellectual property law. And by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. Hi, and welcome to this special edition of the Computer Chronicles. We're on location here in Dana Point, California, right on the beach, covering the third annual Digital Living Room Conference put on by Upside Magazine. What will the next year look like for the consumer with everything going digital? Well, to get answers to that question, we're going to take a look at broadband, the digital music revolution, talking websites, digital photography, and Internet TV. Now, the big news in Internet television is the launch of AOL TV, and the first public demonstration of that took place right here at the conference. This is what it looks like when you surf AOL on your television set. Watch the TV event, and at the same time, on the same screen, find related information on the web. AOL TV is powered by an interactive software engine from Liberate Technologies. Liberate's CEO, Mitchell Kurtzman, says the power of AOL TV is in what it does for the advertiser. Tens of billions of dollars spent each year on TV advertising. And if you think about it, TV ads have only one purpose which is to get you, the consumer, to remember the brand or product being advertised long enough so that when you eventually get somewhere that you might buy something in that category, you remember the one you saw on TV. Well, as you'll see in our demonstration this morning, uh, the Liberate platform enables broadcasters and advertisers and network operators to move the point of sale to the point of advertising, where they have the greatest possible impact on consumer choice and decision making. The main difference between AOL TV and Microsoft Web TV is that a current AOL subscriber maintains the same online identity on AOL TV. Well, AOL TV, we think, is a real breakthrough uh, for several reasons. One is AOL TV will use your same identity that you have on classic AOL, so your same screen name uh, will be on AOL TV. That means your buddy list, instant messages, your preferences, like your stock portfolio, if you want to check your quotes while you're on TV. It does that with a transparent overlay so you can still watch TV. And the other thing is AOL really understands, I think, how to provide content for uh, and support uh, the non-geek audience, let's say, uh, people who aren't at this conference. Uh, and they're very good at supplying technology to the mass markets. AOL subscribers will have to buy a set-top box and pay extra fees, $15 a month, to access their AOL account on a TV set. But with some 22 million subscribers, even a small percentage of converts could mean a significant new business for AOL eventually. It basically leverages off the existing subscribers that AOL already has, so they're targeting it at the 22 million subscribers they have. And you can um, be watching TV and also check your buddy list at the same time. And I think that's sort of a clever strategy. Um, I think that um, these enhanced TV uh, have a long uh, ways to go be to before they are really real compelling. They're interesting, and, and some people will like doing it, So, uh, but we're in the beginning of that curve. Indeed, there is a big question as to whether or not existing AOL subscribers are prepared to pay extra just to access the Internet on their TV set. The one problem with living in the digital living room is being nibbled to death by monthly fees. If you're an AOL subscriber, you're going to have to pay an extra $15 a month to use this thing. That's $180 a year. If you're already an AOL member, you probably already have a computer and you can already get your email and do your web surfing and your instant messaging on your computer. So you're going to pay another $180 a year in service fees to do those same things on your television set. I'm a little skeptical about that. But the folks at AOL and at Liberate think consumers will want Internet-style interactivity on television because of what it lets you do. It allows you to uh, enhance TV. So, for example, it would allow you to play along with a game show like Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy today, both broadcast interactive content that works on our platform and Microsoft's platform. Uh, and so you could do something like that. You can do what we demonstrated here, which is see the lyrics of the music video you're watching or to be able to click on another button and buy the CD 
of the artist whose video is on right now. It would take you right directly to a music website like CD Now, and you could do a transaction on the spot through an e-wallet. But even if consumers like the idea of interactive television, AOL TV is going to face some tough competition. The cable companies themselves could provide their own system with some form of interactive cable uh, uh, television box. Uh, I expect fully to see other vendors playing in this space, especially the telcos. Um, so it's too early to tell who will be the dominant players, but I have to say that if you look at AOL TV, especially with their connection to Time Warner and all the Warner Brothers content, and Microsoft, who I guarantee within the next six months is going to get on an acquisition path to bring in content to their own web TV, they'll probably be the two 900-pound gorillas fighting it out in the long run. In fact, Web TV has just announced its own new twist to the convergence of the TV and the PC, a new version of Web TV which lets you use it like a TiVo or replay personal VCR. We announced a very significant relationship, and that's the next generation Web TV device that is going to be a, a partnership between Thompson, which makes RCA devices, Direct TV, and Microsoft Web TV. So that product will enable viewers at home to do rewind, fast forward, pause live television, but you can do it with two shows. The ability to watch one football game in one, screen, in one window, the ability to watch another, pause, rewind, and fast forward. But TiVo and Replay themselves are moving toward the next generation of interactive TV, finding new ways to use storage and connectivity to provide a customized television viewing experience. We're going to start getting new kinds of information and entertainment and even advertising on these hard disks because once you've got the hard disk in the home, it's no problem at 3 in the morning when no one's watching to load in certain commercials that are designed to appeal to someone matching your profile. Um, you could also download news clips that you could stitch together into a news show you want to see so there'll be choices of the programming you want. While TiVo, Replay, Web TV, and AOL TV are focused on bringing internet-type functionality to your television set, other companies are trying to bring television-style programming to the internet. One good example is a company called Vion. What they demonstrated here was TV-style content on the web that you can control. Watching a surfing show? Pick which competitor you want to see. Want more information on a sponsor? Just click. Want to find out where to buy that cool outfit she's wearing? Just click on it. Or like the music on the site? Just click to find out more about the group. Vion is trying to move beyond AOL TV and Web TV to a new model where interactivity is video-based. Today, interactive TV is more text-based interactivity. Um, in the future, I think, you know, the video is going to be the primary experience. People want to see the video. Okay, they want to see the program. Now, I think in the future, interactive TV will be more subtle. It'll be, you know, if I click on something, then I can go to the related information. Otherwise, I can just sit back and enjoy my experience. But I think we're going to start to develop the way users will react to various content. And I don't think anybody knows how, what that's going to look like. But I think it's going to be much more immersive, much more video-centric. I think we'll get rid of all this text-based interactivity. It really takes away from the programming and the value of the programming. A company called eSync showed off another approach to TV-style content on the web. One problem with watching video on the Internet is the battle of players. Do you need Windows Media Player, Real Networks Player, or QuickTime? eSync has come out with a multi-platform player that can play back video in any standard format and automatically sync the video to a website. The player is called ChoiceCaster, and it's a free download. And eSync takes video on the net one step further adding a virtual VCR that notifies you about upcoming internet video events and will soon be able to automatically save them for you. Another approach to internet video is from a company called On24. If you're a stock market junkie, you probably watch CNBC or CNN FM. The trouble there is you have to look at a lot of stuff you don't really care about. On24 has introduced something called Personal Cast that lets you essentially create a personalized CNBC service, your investor console. You select the stocks you want to follow, the sources and experts you want to hear from, and you can actually pick the particular stories you want to see. Putting TV-style content on the web is also opening up new opportunities 
for the creative community. One site that is focusing on new entertainment content is Anti.com. At Anti.com, we allow people, anyone, with a video camera and an idea to post their video to our website. In fact, you can just send us a videotape and we'll put it up for you. And then we have a proprietary voting mechanism that actually tells us what people want to watch as opposed to gambling millions of dollars on what they might want to watch. We then take those pieces that have come to the top and that clearly a lot of people are interested in seeing more of, and we spend money on developing those into whatever they might be. It could be a television pilot, it could be an interactive game. Uh, and so basically we then take those to the next level. So just as the internet has leveled the playing field in e-commerce and in music, the same thing is happening now with TV and movies. One enabling technology for the future Steven Spielbergs of the Internet comes from a new company called PSMG, the Play Streaming Media Group. The technology sits inside this box, the Globecaster. It's essentially a computer peripheral that turns your PC into a complete video production studio. This, for example, was PSMG's on-stage demonstration at Digital Living Room, and this is the same scene after Globecaster processed and encoded the signal for a live webcast. PSMG also provides a variety of producer services, offering one-stop shopping for the Internet TV station of the future. One of the hottest topics here at the Digital Living Room Conference was the digital music revolution, MP3, Napster, Nutella, millions of people around the world sharing music, downloading songs, and generally not paying anything for it. The digital music panel here at the conference included some of the top players in the MP3 and Napster revolution. The panelists, largely representing the new digital music business, were careful not to endorse the unlicensed use of music. But when it comes to Napster, there wasn't much sympathy at this conference for the recording industry's position. Right now, I can't support the recording industry because they're, they're ripping us off with CDs. You know, wh why do I have to get the song that I want along with 11 loser titles on a, on a plastic coaster and pay $18 for it? That's ridiculous. I, you know, I should be able to download it in two minutes and just get the song, only the one that I want. And it shouldn't cost a lot of money. It should cost very little. If I can tell uh, my neighbor, come over to my house, I'll make you uh, a copy of a uh, videotape I have. Uh, if that's fair use, why can't I do the same thing on the computer and let people come and make copies of my music files? Uh, I think it's uh, a debate that's going to be resolved in the courts, and I don't really believe, like here at this conference, all the music executives want to say that uh, people that use Napster are thieves and that they're stealing and I think that's to be proven. In fact, I think it's probably going to fall down somewhere in the middle, but it could be that this is fair use. And so it's, it's you know, as long as you're not selling the, the music that you download, you're just trading it and playing it. I don't think there's anything really wrong with that. We're seeing incredible technology that is bringing music into the homes and consumers, into the cars, the, the jogging trails, uh, faster than it ever has been before. The only thing that's holding back the technology is the music industry itself. The music industry seems to want to put more resources into their lawyers suing Napster or mp3.com than they want to put into embracing technologies that's going to bring their product closer into people's lives. The problem in, or the question is, how can you do this in a way that protects the rights of the artist and at the same time protects the needs of the consumer. One way, maybe for the music industry to be more realistic about its pricing models, do they really need to get $18 for a CD that costs them 10 cents to press? The general view here was that the music industry has to wake up to the 21st century, change its business model, and take advantage of the digital music revolution. The recording industry needs, or somebody needs to provide a legal alternative to illegal free MP3 downloads. And by legal and by viable alternative, I don't mean $2.50. I don't mean $2 per song. I'm talking about 10 cents per song, OK? Teenagers have an unlimited capacity for music. And if you make it 10 cents a song, they'll download 10,000 songs in a year. You know, there's good money in that. And it, has, it starts to take on the economies of scale and the network effects of the software industry. 
the beautiful thing about the software industry and the reason Bill Gates is so rich is that you get a bunch of brilliant people together and you, you make some software and you slap it on CDs and once you've done that work, you can sell 10,000 or you can sell 10 million and the more you sell, the more money you make and there is almost no additional costs for you to sell those additional copies. And that's the beauty of digital distribution for music. Some companies in the digital music business are trying to carve out a new model on the internet. One of them is Soundbreak.com, which is essentially running an alternative music format global radio station on the net. There's, there's a world of difference. In fact, there's very little similarity between us and Napster or, frankly, for any of the other music sites. The, the only similarity is we're all involved in music, but that's like comparing Muzak to uh, a Rolling Stones concert. There's really very, very little similarity. Uh, what we're doing is, Napster is, is, is obviously about downloading music. You have to know what it is that you want. We, we, we believe there's a whole step before that where you have to learn what you like before you know what you want, and we're filling in there. As far as the legal issue, um, all of our music is done streamed, unless in the commerce part you want to digitally download it, which we only do if the artist and the label want it to be that way. The Napster controversy is important because the basic concept of file sharing across the Internet has far greater application than just to the music business. Today, if I want to sell something on uh, eBay, I basically post it, and the best I can do is put a picture up there. But what if, using a Napster-like technology, I can store on my hard drive at the house uh, whatever the item, information on the item, but it could be in video format, it could be audio, it could be, you know, 10, 15 megabyte file. Well, as more people get higher speed uh, access, um, the idea would be to go to, go to, AO, uh, to eBay and and basically it'll have my item and then it'll say click here for more information. I think when you look at Napster, you need to actually look at the other, the, the other implications of Napster beyond music and companies like Nutella, Scour, uh, Pointera are all going to mine that, that area over the next two years. For any of this new digital consumer technology to really take off, the home has to become networked. Computers, TV sets, stereos and other appliances have to eventually talk to each other. There are many different technology approaches right now to networking the home, most of them too complex for the average consumer. Consumers in our consumer research have been telling us that they're really frustrated with technology. They said, I mean, they told us we thought it would make our lives more simple and it's making them more complicated. We thought it would save us time and it's costing us more time. So they're very frustrated with technology. They want, us, they want uh, technology that's easier to use. They think it's too difficult to install and manage and use. They want technology that actually uh, comes bundled as a solution. They don't want to have to go to a supermarket and pick out a piece of this and a piece of that and wire their own home and become their own network integrators. Another problem for home networking is that it doesn't currently add market value to your home. So one consumer networking company, Home Director, an IBM spinoff, is trying to get the real estate industry to recognize the increased appraisal value of a network home. If you were to go do competitive market assessment today to sell your house, there's things on the list such as an extra garage or an extra room, and those have uh, values that a real estate agent assigns to them. Today, there's nothing about what kind of wiring infrastructure or networking infrastructure you have. However, if it were to be on the list, not only would it have more appraisal value, but you'd be able to get a higher mortgage and everything. So it's our job as an industry to move that onto the list. And nobody wakes up in the morning and says, aha, I have to put in a home network, right? They have an application they care about. Like let's say they just got broadband access and they have three PCs in the home and they want to connect them. Well, today it's fairly complicated thing to do. I mean, a consumer has to go to a computer store and they have to look at all their very various options. You know, do I want Ethernet or HPNA or 802.11 and how am I going to have to, what, what am I going to have to do to enable my computers and how am I going to get this set up, how am I going to configure the network. It's very complex. But there are many reasons for networking your home, not just your PCs, but your appliances. I think eventually you're going to want to have everything in your home network and people always joke about why would you want to network your washing machine it actually makes sense. Why not? If your washing machine, if the hose bursts, you know, and the water's going all over the floor, and you've put the wash in and gone to the supermarket, wouldn't you want your cell phone to ring and say, hey, come home right now, your house is flooding? While most home networking solutions are now PC-based, a company called Vicinium introduced a television-based networking system run from a set-top box. Vicinium lets you not only network your home, but your entire neighborhood. 
The ideal home network would be a wireless one, so you could access a variety of devices from anywhere in the home or even outside the home. A company called SohoWare was showing off a new broadband wireless network product called the Net Blaster. It lets you use your high-speed internet connection on a laptop anywhere within 250 feet of the home base. The wireless home network is one of those technologies you have to experience to appreciate. My husband uh, took some boxes that had arrived from a company that wanted me to try out their wireless home networking. I'd been ignoring the boxes for a few days. I just didn't have time to deal with it. And so he puttered around the house for a little bit. I had no idea what he was doing. And I was sitting out in the backyard with my dad who was visiting. My dad had just asked me a bunch of questions that I knew I could answer if I were able to surf the web. And my husband came walking out with my laptop computer. And I said, well, what good's that going to do me? I mean, we don't have the DSL out in the backyard. And he pointed at this little thing he'd stuck in the side of the laptop. And he said, we do now. And I sat there in the backyard and surfed around and got the answers that my dad was looking for. Um, and it was a tremendous experience to realize that I was untethered. For the first time, I was truly untethered, and it was a very powerful experience. Of course, the real power of a networked home comes when you have a high-speed internet connection. But so far, getting that and getting it to work have been frustrating experiences for the consumer. I, I am amazed and continually disappointed at the tech industry's tendency to overpromise and underdeliver. And lately, that has taken the form most prominently in the campaigns to sell uh, high-speed service, uh, data service in people's homes, which has been pretty dreadful for a lot of people who have bought it, and dreadful for people who've tried to buy it because they haven't been able to get connected. I, I really hope that the cable and phone companies figure that out soon. Everyone is sensitive these days to computer security issues. It seems there's a new virus popping up every day. More and more homes getting wired to always-on cable modems or DSL. So one of the hot topics here was Internet security and privacy. During a panel on Internet security, the audience was bluntly reminded of the risks involved in downloading an executable, like an e-greeting card. And once it's on your system, the hacker can have complete control of what's on your system, can see all your files and what have you. That's the dangerous thing for privacy. We gather up all this information, we're connected to everybody, and it's really child's play to use the tools that are on the web to hack into your site. Uh, I'm not a, I don't have a technical background, and I, and I really do promise you that I think I can probably hack into virtually any corporation in the world. Many people don't realize that once they have an always-on broadband internet service running through their home, they are a terminal on a network and very vulnerable to a hack attack. Most people say, hey, I'm just a home user. What do hackers want with me? Well, the reality is, is they want your credit card number. They want your personal identification information, like your social security number. They want to get into your online trading account and your online banking. They want to just be a voyeur and look at, hey, where have you been surfing? Uh, or they want to use your machine to attack other machines. Like you might get, you might get the FBI someday knocking on your door, these guys in dark suit and glasses, you know, looking like this, and you don't know that the hacker had used your machine to attack the Pentagon. Network Ice showed off a new consumer version of its network security product called Black Ice Defender. It does a lot more than just scan your computer for viruses. We monitor network traffic looking for signs of hacker activity. It's much like how a virus scanner monitors your hard drive looking for our hostile programs. Well, we look at the network traffic coming in and out of your machine looking for hostile activity. We then alert you to it, and then we'll block it as appropriate. Several companies here were addressing the new need for network security protection in the home, among them 3Com, whose new home gateway comes complete with firewall protection. Firewall is important to home users that have broadband connections because the, the uh, broadband connection is on all the time. And so what this particular type of software does is actually allow, allows the um, gateway to identify viruses, for example, before they ever come into the home, before they ever like, are rooted to a PC. So it gives you an extra layer of protection. And it's very similar to the type of protection that a commercial uh, 
Endeavor would use, but at a price that users can afford. Another new home security product introduced here was SurfingGuard from Finjon Software. SurfingGuard is a free product that we introduced on May 11th. In fact, we were announcing it around the world when the I Love You virus hit. And it also protects people against Trojan executables, which are those, you know, those fun e-greeting cards or e-games that we pass from friend to friend. Often they're a vehicle for hackers to take the most popular card or game, attach some malicious code to it, a, a hacker payload, if you will, and that's the way, that's the way they're able to proliferate this uh, malicious code to an awful lot of people in a very short amount of time. Surf and Guard can catch hostile executables like this dangerous Trojan horse embedded in an innocent looking game. The Trojan horse gets past antivirus software because it's been compressed and disguised. Antivirus software is great. Remember it started 15 years ago when we were passing viruses from floppy disk to floppy disk. Now we have 200 million people interconnected on the internet. So while the antivirus companies are saying we're getting better, we had about $10 billion of damage with I Love You because in, they're inherently reactive. There's 50,000 known viruses. The 50,000 in first, somebody has to get the flu, they have to develop an antidote, and then disseminate it to hundreds of millions of desktops before we're all protected. That's it for part one of our special coverage of Upside's Digital Living Room Conference. We'll have lots more next week. For the Computer Chronicles, I'm Stuart Chaffee in Dana Point, California. The Computer Chronicles is brought to you by rondiamond.com, the oldies site on the internet. Music and memories from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, not just another jukebox. Additional support comes from the law offices of Ivan Hoffman, lawyering with integrity for internet law, copyright, trademark, and other intellectual property law. And by TechWeb for up-to-the-minute technology news. To purchase a videotape copy of today's program, call toll-free 1-888-310-7850. Please specify the show number and the topic.